Hey guys, I'm Chris. Hey everybody, I'm Robert. And we're the Film Flamers. And we are here to talk about more Ian McKellen. That's right. This is our second deep dive of Pride Month, where we are focusing on the talents and legacy of Ian McKellen, even though he is still with us. That's right. <laughs> we started with whatever the fuck that movie was, App Pupil. <laughs> <laughs> whatever the fuck. The Nazi one. Yeah. That other Nazi one that we discovered. Um, and this time around, we're talking about Gods and Monsters, which is Ian McKellen as a one of our most important gays, playing another one of our most important gays with Brendan Fraser, who plays an important gay in an Oscar-winning role this year, because we're on Patreon, going to cover the whale. That's right. And this is James Whale, who Ian McKellen <laughs> is playing. Anyway. I mean, there are so many dots to connect. I'm just trying to convince everyone that we're doing the right thing. I don't we are doing the right thing. Even though these are barely horror j- This one certainly is not really. Well, it's about horror movies. It is. Yeah. It's important horror history. Yes. That's exactly what it is. Right. But the, the whale over on Patreon? Yeah, that's not a horror franchise at all. We just want to talk about it. Yeah, we do. Well, and I just want to watch it. I've never seen it before. So <laughs> Yeah. I'm I know. Looking forward to it. I'm excited. I'm probably going to blubber. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> During the whale. Uh, but anywho, <clears throat> Gods and Monsters is a 1998 period drama film that recounts the partly fictionalized last days of the life of film director James Whale, whose experience of World War I is a central theme, along with his legacy of directing cinema classics like Frankenstein, The Dark Old House, The Invisible Man, Bride of Frankenstein, and Showboat. Didn't we watch The Dark Old House recently? We In watched it. A year or two? During our second season, because we were supposed to be on someone else's podcast about oh, so it. Longer. Yeah. It's yeah. I liked it. I liked it too. It was good. Yeah. And it was lost for a while. Mm-hmm. And then someone found it. I, I like James Will's movies. Yeah. So. The film stars Ian McKellen. Well, Sir Ian McKellen. I yes. suppose. Brendan Fraser, Lynn Redgrave, Lita Davidovich, and David Dukes. That's kind of an unfortunate name. Mm-hmm. An international co-production between the United Kingdom and the United States, the film is written and directed by Bill Condon, another one of our important gays. Yes. Based on Christopher Bram's 1995 novel, Father of Frankenstein. That's an interesting last name, Bram. <laughs> it's all coming together. <laughs> our, our, our board, our giant whiteboard of like red yarn doing connections. <laughs> this is larger. being strung ever. We're going to have to go down to Hobby Lobby and get more yarn. But wait, there's more. Clive Barker served as executive producer for this movie. Another important gay. Yes. So there you go. As we will undoubtedly get into later, James Whale was an openly gay English director who did most of his work in Hollywood, creating some of Universal's most classic horror films. His openness about his sexuality has led many to find gay subtext in these movies, namely Bride of Frankenstein. But it's also believed that his unwillingness to be closeted may have at least partially brought about an untimely end to his career. Okay, listeners. My life is a game of strip poker. Want to play? This is Gods and Monsters. Lights, sound. Okay for sound. Action. The Bride of Frankenstein. A man with a legendary career behind him. Who's this new yard man? Mr. Boom, by it, I thought something be. He came cheap. A man with his life still ahead of him. Hey, the master wants to know if you're free for lunch. I do have a lawn this afternoon. I'm free until then. Expect nothing fancy. Come in, Mr. Boom. Separated by class. Are you famous? I was merely a director. Do you have the most architectural skull? Have you ever sat for an artist? By time. You were a soldier. I was an officer in the trenches. And by desires. All I know is bugger. He's a bugger. Does that surprise you? I'm not. You know. Mm. I did not think you were a bugger at all. They have nothing in common. Mr. Clayton Boone. My gardener. He's never met a princess. Only queens. Except their humanity. I've spent much of my life outrunning the past. And now it floods all over me. I'm losing my mind. Every day a new piece of it goes, and soon there'll be none of it left. My condition will continue to deteriorate until the end of my life. Why are you here? Let's get this straight. What did you want from me? What do you want? Just back from the hospital already, you're chasing after boys. Oh, shut up. Man's gonna make up his life alone. 
a philosopher. Thoreau, with a lawnmower. Do you believe people come into our lives for a purpose? To a new world of gods and monsters. <laughs> so, we understand each other. Right. Open my door. In the 1950s, James Whale, played by Ian McKellen, the director of Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, has long since retired. Whale lives with his longtime housemaid Hannah, played by Lynn Redgrave, who loyally cares for him but disapproves of his homosexuality. He has suffered a series of strokes that have left him fragile and tormented by memories, growing up as a poor outcast, his tragic World War I service, and the filming of The Bride of Frankenstein. Quayle slips into his past and indulges in his memories and fantasies, reminiscing about homosexual pool parties and sexually harassing an embarrassed starstruck fan. He battles depression and at times contemplates suicide as he realizes his life and his health are slipping away. Quayle befriends his young hot gardener and horticult... <laughs> Horticulturalist. Horticulturalist. <laughs> Horticulturalist. <laughs> Clayton Boone, played by Brendan Fraser. And the two begin a strange and uneasy friendship as Clayton poses for whale sketches with increasingly fewer articles of clothing. The two men bond while discussing their lives and dealing with whale's spells of disorientation and weakness from strokes. Clayton, impressed with Whale's fame, watches Bride of Frankenstein on television, and his friends mock the movie, his friendship with Whale, and Whale's probably homosexual intentions. <laughs> Clayton assures Whale that he is straight, and receives Whale's assurance that there is no sexual interest. But Clayton storms out like a big man-baby when Whale discusses his sexual history, what with all the pool parties and cock gobbling. <laughs> Clayton later returns with the agreement that no such locker room discussions occur again. With his newfound agreement, Clayton is invited to escort Whale to a party hosted by George Cooker for Princess Margaret. There, a photo op has been arranged for Whale with his monsters, Boris Karloff and Elsa Lanchester, from ancient movie fame. This event exacerbates Whale's depression, as he doesn't want to be remembered as just that monster movie director, feeling that his tight, masculine body of work was larger than that. <laughs> a sudden rainstorm begins an excuse. <laughs> a sudden rainstorm begins an excuse to exit the dismal party, making both Whale and Clayton soaking wet. Back at Whale's home, Clayton needs a dry change of clothes. Whale can only find a sweater, so Clayton wears a towel wrapped around his waist. Whale decides to try to sketch Clayton one more again. After several minutes, he shows his previous sketches to Clayton, admitting that he has lost his ability to draw due to his declining health and lack of passion. Feeling sorry for Whale, and like a true horticulturalist, Clayton thinks it's a good idea to drop his towel to pose nude, giving Whale one last chance to draw another masturbate piece. Mm, masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> Excited, Whale makes him wear a World War I gas mask to hide Clayton's face and enhance his figure, and promptly uses the opportunity to make an aggressive sexual advance on Clayton, kissing his shoulder and neck and forcefully reaches for his generals. An enraged Clayton beats off, fights off Whale, who confesses that pissing Clayton off had been his plan all along, and begs Clayton to kill him to relieve him of his suffering. Clayton refuses, puts Whale to bed, and falls asleep downstairs. The next morning, Hannah is alarmed when she cannot find Whale. Prompting a panicked search, Clayton finds Whale floating dead in the pool as a distraught Hannah runs out, clutching a suicide note she found in his room. 
Clayton Brody and Hooper set out on Clayton's boat, the orc got to fetch a whale's body. <laughs> <laughs> While Brody lays down a chum line, Clayton waits for an opportunity to hook whale. Clayton prepares to sever the line to prevent the chancel from being pulled out, but the clean flakes off, keeping the barrels attached to whale. <laughs> with whale hooked, Clayton heads toward the edge of the pool with whale in his arms, pulling him out of the water. <clears throat> but in order to remove all possible scandal or guilt from Whale and himself, Hannah convinces him to place Whale back in the pool and leave. The orca sinks. <laughs> whale floats. <laughs> Sever the line. <clears throat> Seriously, though. A decade later, Clayton and his son Michael watch Brighter Frankenstein on television. Michael is skeptical of his father's claim that he knew Whale, but Clayton produces a sketch of the Frankenstein monster drawn by Whale signed to Clayton. Friend? Satisfied with impressing his son, Clayton takes the trash out and walks down the street in the rain, remembering Whale and miming the movements of Frankenstein's monster. The end. <laughs> the orca sinks. Whale floats. <laughs> oh my oh, god. That's horrible. I mean, we should be more respectful. We should, but anytime that joke can be brought back <laughs> into an episode, I will fully accept it. <laughs> Gods and Monsters premiered at Sundance in January 1998 and was released in the U.S. on November 4th, later the same year by Lionsgate. Despite early Sundance buzz, the film only opened on six screens and earned 75000 that weekend, claiming the 19th spot at the box office. Mm. Gods and Monsters would enter its widest release around Oscar season in 1999, playing on 149 screens, but would never earn the dollars that distributors hoped for. Ultimately, the film would gross little more than $6 million against a budget of $10 million. Yeah, but at the same time, I have to imagine that Ian McKellen was getting to be a very household name in the U.S. Yes, because of our people our and people, this. and then this, yeah. and then, of course, the news was coming out that he was playing Magneto and Gandalf. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess technically this then after people, right? It said January, but it said it was uh, only on six screens. And then it was oh, released no, around Oscar season 1999. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So technically released limitedly before App Pupil, but then wide afterwards. Mm-hmm. So they were kind of overlapping a little bit. Yeah. So, I mean, it was, a, it was a big time for Ian McKellen for sure. Plus he got that Oscar nom. So, I mean, yeah. yeah. And then he was nominated again for Lord of the Rings Fellowship of the Ring in 2001. Uh-huh. That is correct. Uh-huh. Gods and Monsters holds a 96% on Rotten Tomatoes and is certified fresh. The audience score sits at 82%. The site's consensus reads, Gods and Monsters is a spellbinding, confusing piece of semi-fiction featuring fine performances. Ian McKellen leads the way, but Redgrave and Frazier don't lag far behind. Mm, true. It is true. I think all the performances are good. Yeah. We'll talk about that. I'm I sure. love Lynn Redgrave in this. This is one of her best roles. Agreed. You would never know. Like, I, I didn't. I was like, that's Lynn Redgrave? Mm-hmm. Totally true. Graves. The film received mostly positive critical acclaim, most of which focused on the main three performances. Roger Ebert awarded the film three out of four stars and called it a biopic leading toward a graceful elegy. Later in his review, he would write, Gods and Monsters is not a deep or powerful film, but it is a good-hearted one, in which we sense the depth of early loss that helped shape Whale's protective style. Sean Means, for the Salt Lake Tribune, <clears throat> called the film a, quote, revelation for writer-director Bill Condon, whose last movie, the horror schlock Candyman, Farewell to the Flesh, showed no indication of the intelligence and tenderness at work here. In The Advocate, Jan Stewart wrote, quote, God and Monsters is a triumph on all levels, a movie for people who love movies and for people who love people who love movies. Well said, Jan. Sure, Jan. 
It has some accolades. It actually has a lot of accolades, but here are just some. Yeah, it's like a full page <clears throat> of accolades or near-miss accolades, really. Yeah, it didn't win a lot, but it was nominated for quite a bit. A shit ton. Yeah. At the Academy Awards, it was nominated for Best Actor and Best Supporting Actress, and it won Best Adapted Screenplay. That's right. Mm-hmm. And for the Golden Globes, it was nominated for Best Actor and Best Picture Drama, and it won Best Supporting Actress for Lynn Redgrave. Correct. At the Independent Spirit Awards, it was nominated for Best Screenplay, but it won Best Feature, Best Actor, and Best Supporting Actress. Right. Do you know that? Uh, do you know if Brendan Fraser was nominated at all? I didn't see any nominations for him. I remember watching this and uh, just really being wrapped into Ian McKellen and Lynn Redgrave's performances. But if you look at Brendan Fraser's work across, you know, he would go on after this and do The Mummy, yep. which was really big in 1999. Mm-hmm. And then um, uh, before that, he was in a bunch of like teen movies. Yeah. And this was like kind of the Man and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. And so it's like he's done a lot of different, especially now with The Whale. Mm-hmm. He has a lot of interesting, really wide ranging performances. And it's like we just didn't have that perspective back then. We just thought he was kind of playing it closer to the chest back then. Yeah. I mean, I feel like. I mean, we're probably getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but he was in like Encino Man and shit like that, you know? And then we get things like he was in School Ties early in his career, and that was very melodramatic. But I remember seeing this for the first time and going like, wow, I mean, like, that's the guy from Encino Man. Like, he's good. He's good in this. And I feel like our appreciation for Brendan Fraser has changed now. But I feel like... That happens when a actor has like a renaissance or something. Yeah, I feel like what's happening to Brendan Fraser now happened to John Travolta like 20 years ago. Yeah, or even like um, Jennifer Jason Lee today, you know? I mean, because he was making things like Monkey Bone. He was taken for granted, yeah. Yeah, Monkey Bone. Yeah, he was Tarzan or something. Yeah, he was Tarzan. Something like that. He was always in goofy shit. Yeah. Anyway, at the Saturn Awards, at one special (laughs) award. So I guess because of its subject matter, right? Because it's about James Whale. I would assume that, you know, Saturn Awards gave it a special award, but I don't know what that is. Yeah, I tried to figure out what that was exactly, but it's all that I could find was special award. So it didn't say why. It just it just got an award from the Saturn Awards. I don't know. You know, Clive Barker was involved in this, and so he probably had some ties into Saturn. But I'm, I'm kind of, you know, wondering. I don't know how, how long, like, Fangoria Chainsaw Awards have been out, you know. Or uh, a long like time. That. Because the same year... Apt people won some Fangoria Chainsaw Awards. Oh, right? interesting. Oh, yeah. And also it won like best, didn't it win like best horror at the Saturn? Awards? Yeah, it sure did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So back to this cast, obviously Sir Ian McKellen, my knee jerk is to say that he did a better job because it's more of a transportive performance in Apt Pupil where he has to, you know, do the German accent and everything else. But in this, I'd say it's even more nuanced and subtle or just as much, right? Just he's not doing the accent. Versus on the other side, Lynn Redgrave is having to do the German accent and stuff this time around. So it's really, really interesting um, to watch these two because they just really, really made a a good like on-screen couple in a way. They really did. There are some moments that they share uh, together, especially when they're watching Bride of Frankenstein, right? Sort of at the same time that Clayton is watching it, just, you know, opposite sides of the city. And... You know, they clearly have rapport together, but they they bicker back and forth in a way that an old couple would. Yeah. You know, I was laughing at like he's constantly saying goodbye. Go. You can go now. You can go. (laughs) And then looking for her like almost immediately afterward or whatever. And then whenever they are separate and talking about each other, it seems like, oh, yeah, we don't really care about each other or she has a whole spiel about his homosexuality. I love him, but he's going to hell type of situation. You You know. know. So great, but they clearly, clearly love each other. And yeah. And that kind of gets into my view of this as being like less kind of perfectly imperfect because it's almost an apologistic or an apologist stance or view on James whale Mm -hmm. for the 1998 audience. Yes. I would. Yeah. I would agree with that actually. Uh, I'm sure we'll be talking about that. Oh yeah. I mean, first I, I think we should really talk about, I mean, obviously we, we have the rest of this cast, which is, you know, Brendan Fraser. We've already talked about him. Uh, I'm not really sure much about, about the other people here. I, I don't, I don't remember who Betty was. Was that the, she was the bartender, the bartender. Yeah. Lolita Davidovich. Lolita then- Davidovich is, I mean, she was, she got a lot of work in the nineties. Like she, she was in lots of, she was in one of my favorite, like horror adjacent De Palma movies called Raising Cain. Hmm. Um, 
she played a lot of like kind of sexy roles right and her look almost never changed she always had like long auburn kind of hair sometimes curly right i mean but i remember her from lots of things in the 90s and she was usually a very very good actress yeah she did great here it's just she's not one of the big three here like, no this, this i mean story like, is really a trifecta you know is really and really boiled down it's it's in mckellen and Brendan fraser really i mean even some of the bit parts in this you know, like they're they're good. It's just that they're they're in it so fleetingly that you wouldn't yeah be able to say what what an amazing performance. You know, we have David Dukes as David Lewis, who, who plays as um, David Lewis is his longtime partner and a producer in yes. Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And then I did write down Todd Babcock as Leonard Barnett, which is who plays as a like flashback World War One pseudo lover, mm-hmm. which I only bring up because it might come up later. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I also thought the people that played like Karloff and Lancaster yeah. were good, you know, and it's it's always neat to see people play real life people or whatever. I mean, I don't know enough about Princess them. Margaret and George Cukor. Were, yeah. We're fun to see. I mean, because I was just like, oh, Princess Margaret the whole time, you know, but yeah. <clears throat> I mean, like every everybody in this movie was serviceable. I just feel like these these three main performances are very, very good. Because at its heart, it's really like a... a like single location, small cast type of situation. Yeah. I mean, as as small as that house was or whatever, but, but yeah, like it's these three people interacting together solely at this house. Right. And I really appreciate that. But uh, I would go so far as to say like Brendan Fraser probably was overlooked in a lot of these awards. And maybe that was a really competitive year for best supporting actor or something. Maybe, but he but didn't really have much to do. He was I, a little I muppety, he was you know? good though. He was very good at yeah. what, the, what the role had to be, but the role wasn't, really nuanced the guy isn't really nuanced no i mean it's kind of a one-note character but until the end you don't realize how sensitive he really is Mm -hmm. although he makes he makes choices and then doesn't like his own choices and we'll talk about that he's trapped by his own toxic masculinity Masculinity. right exactly we need to talk about james whale Mm -hmm. right and so whale was born uh as he says in the movie it's very very similar if not exactly like it was in real life into a large family in dudley worcestershire i guess uh, now the metropolitan borough of dudley oh he uh, discovered his artistic talent early on and studied art but with the outbreak of world war one he enlisted in the british army and became an officer he was actually captured by the germans which doesn't really go into much in the movie if at all and during his time as a prisoner of war he realized he was interested in drama <laughs> <laughs> I oh. don't know the connection there other than the obvious one, but I mean, maybe he spent a lot of time. Oh, the drama of this. I'm a prisoner <laughs> of war. He created all these plays in his head. He talked to himself a lot. So following the release, his release at the end of the war, he became an actor, a set designer and a director. So his success directing the 1928 play journeys end led to his move to the U S and uh, first to direct that play on Broadway and then to Hollywood to direct films. He lived in Hollywood for the rest of his life, most of that time with his longtime romantic partner, producer David Lewis, who we mentioned previously. And he pretty quickly got a contract and was basically given this list of movies to direct. He chose Frankenstein. He thought it was the most interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, like he did a lot of work for Universal. Very, very quickly, too. Like Frankenstein was 1931. The Dark Old House was 1932. The Invisible Man, 1933, Bride of Frankenstein, 1935, and Showboat, 1936. So in just five years, he did all of these classics. Well, and I don't think that's unheard of for the Hollywood system back then. They were pumping movies out. Wow. I mean, but these are some of these are big and, and you know, yeah. many, many decade classics. Well, these films have certainly stood the test of time. They have. Right. And I when people look back on like the early days of cinema, I feel like when you look at Universal, everyone that's the one that everyone goes to. Every right? single one of these movies came out before Wizard of Oz. <laughs> oh my God, you're right. Like these are pretty much the, the only other like really big classic movies that you would add into the horror genre would be like Wolfman, right? Maybe Family Dracula's Opera, and, Dracula. Yeah. But like he did a lot, he did a lot of these, right? And they're they're very very good movies. They hold up today, in my opinion. A little hokey. I need to go back and see them again. I I want to go back and see this The Dark Old House because like I, I love that in the movie they're talking about these films and they're like there's no funny. And there's there's the, there's no uh, there's only scary and funny. You can't be both, mm. right? And that was the, what the bartenderess said. And I just wanted to throw something at my TV screen, and I was like, no, there was like a fucking rainbow of genre within horror. Yes, and every in every genre really, but especially the genres. 
in general. Well, and I kind of remember laughing at the dark old house when we watched it. It was supposed to be. Like, yes. That was his whole thing coming out of German expressionism, right? Was to have comedy and, and tragedy in kind of a poetic sense inside of horror. Yes. Right? And gothic romance and all of that stuff has that in it. So he was well aware of what he was doing. And so when people go back and they're laughing during these movies, oh, it's so hokey or something. It was like, well, guess what? You know, maybe a little bit of the horror was a little bit more taken seriously back in the day. But the, what you're laughing at now is what they were laughing at back then. You know, all the tongue in cheek stuff back then is understood as that today, too. You know, that's true. And I feel like sometimes like people just don't really people who are not used to watching older films. Right. Well, some of these pre code films can be rather sophisticated, especially morally and ethically. Oh, no, I completely agree with that, you know, but sometimes you'll get an actor in front of the camera who's really hamming it up for whatever reason. And I mean, like sometimes these performances are kind of like way over the top. Yeah. I mean, that can't be helped sometimes. And yeah, but I mean, like the way Frankenstein Karloff is acting in, in, you know, Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, you know, it's kind of caveman like or whatever. And Mm. but we have everything that's based off of that from 1932 or whatever to today. And all of the stuff that's been riffing off of it since and has evolved from it. So to us, that's not original, but back then it was, right? Oh, completely. So that's also something to keep in mind. That's true. So as far as film style, Whale was really heavily influenced by the German Expressionism movement, right? And so in fact, he actually screened The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which had come out in 1920 and arguably the first horror film ever, ever. Um, he, he screened it multiple times to prepare to shoot Frankenstein. He was a particular fan of director Paul Linney, who actually did the original Waxworks back in 1924. He looked at all of those films and sought out combining, as they did, elements of gothic horror and comedy. So this influence was most evident when you watch his film The Bride of Frankenstein, which is said to be his horror masterpiece. As far as balancing those elements of like commentary with social issues, with horror, with comedy... And all of those different things. It really is like his masterpiece. I feel like, I mean, everyone remembers Frankenstein just from the way that it looks. But I think when you go back and look at all the movies that he made, I feel like that's the one that people sort of latch on to. Like, it really is a very good film. Yeah. And there's a lot of subtext in it. It's been a long time since I've seen that. But I have heard people talk about it. I've read things about it. And I mean, there's there's a lot of James Whale as the person like in that, I think that he expressed himself in that particular movie. Yeah. And it's, it's lauded actually as the finest of all Gothic horror movies. Yep. So bride is frequently hailed as Wales, you know, masterpiece of his whole oeuvre. And think about it. It's just so fucking iconic. Right. I mean, like the costumes, the makeup and things like that. I mean, when you think of bride of Frankenstein, you think of Elsa Lancaster and how she looked, yeah. right? Like it's just so heavily ingrained and horror culture or just cinema culture in jail. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like people who don't watch horror movies or have never even seen that movie know exactly what it is. They, they can picture it in their head and that's saying something about a legacy, right? We've talked about things like that on the podcast before. Like there are so many horror movies that people have never seen. Like people have never seen the shining and yet they know Jack Nicholson's performance, at least like the here's Johnny line or something. Yeah. And to have that kind of a reference, like just so universally known is amazing to me. Well, nothing comes from nothing and and everything comes from something. And so it's like, it's interesting looking at these, these movies from the 20, you know, coming out of the German expressionism movement and all of this like avant-garde kind of Mm -hmm. filmic styles where they're really trying to like learn the movement and really go into left or right field with like how they're going to use the, you know, use the, the new art form essentially with a little bit more, you know, uh, flexibility of how to do it. And with all the new technology and everything coming out and and more mobile use of things. And so you get, you know, people coming out of this German expression and movement like James Whale. And then you get people like, you know, Orson Welles doing interesting things. And like and then you see like the, you know, The Shining, you know, you see Kubrick coming out of that. And then you see Spielberg coming out of that and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so it all comes from this like this line of just like artistic risk. Right. Yeah, it really is. It's artistic risk begetting artistic risk. Right. Exactly. And that's what makes art in general interesting. So. So Whale was known for his use of camera movement. Right. And so his own avant garde of it. So he's credited with being like one of the first directors, if not the first director, to use a 360 degree panning shot in a feature film included in Frankenstein. Because most of these, like if you look at, back and see like a DeMille, Ten Commandments or something, all of those are, are built like stage plays. Yep. 
You know, uh, you can actually go back and, and see like Sunset Boulevard and see kind of how they were shooting that mm-hmm. with actual um, Cecil B. DeMille playing himself and see how they like set all these things up on a stage, like a stage play and shot it like that. And uh, so like when you're doing a 360 shot, you have to have a 360 degree set. Right. And so or at least be on location. And so he was one of the first people, if not the first people to be able to do that. It's interesting. I have not seen Frankenstein in so long. And Same. after after watching this movie, I feel like we needed to do our homework and like watch two other movies at least. To, to I be know, able to talk about this. and I do. I really want to watch them because I feel like, I mean, just from like film, film flamers history, like we haven't really covered anything from this particular time period. It never really even occurred to us to to do a Patreon poll with James Whale's work. Oh, fuck! I know <laughs> what is going on with us. Dick Timber, Cocktober, and now James Whale without doing a Patreon poll. Well, I mean that's fine. Is that what James Whale's poll? <laughs> <laughs> we're not even gobbling that poll. No, <laughs> we were invited to no pool party. Um, I feel like down the line, though, we we would do an episode on Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein. Maybe not like a deep dive for each, but I feel like watching those two movies and have a conversation about it would be a really interesting episode to do. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe it's good we didn't come up with that poll to gobble. Yeah, I really wanted to do the connection stuff, too. But we definitely have to go back and do some of like the, the original classics coming out of German Expressionism. I want to do Nosferatu. You know, I want oh, yeah. to do Cabinet of Caligari. Definitely. Maybe those two paired. And then go on to do like like the history lesson. Maybe we'll do like a, a summer of history lesson or an October or something. For oh, yes. I think that's history. perfect. Perfect for October. Hell yeah. Here we are planning our docket right in front of you. <laughs> this is how the sausage is made, people. <laughs> this is a little behind the scenes for you. We're grinding it out. Well, we need to talk about the road back. Yeah, we do. So w- this is getting to the end of his career, right? Because like he did a lot of stuff after this, right? But his career was mostly that seven-year period, basically, like 1931 to 1937 or so. Um, you know, and so they're saying, they're alluding that like part of his career could have ended because he was openly gay. Mm-hmm. The code was coming up at the end of the 30s and 40s or whatnot. And, um, you know, people were going to war and things were getting more conservative again, right? And so... You know, was it because he was a big old queen or was it because of the road back? And I think it's kind of probably both. They just needed an excuse, right? Because he was making them a lot of really good movies and they just needed one excuse. And so it was also kind of a confluence of events, right? So anyway, the road back was a supposed sequel to All Quiet on the Western Front, the original, and set about combining a strong anti-war message with prescient warnings about the rising dangers of the dictatorship of Nazi Germany. It was intended to be a powerful and controversial picture, and Universal entrusted it to their finest director at the time, James Whale. Oh. So when the film was actually made, Universal Pictures was threatened with a boycott of all of their films by the German government, unless the anti-Nazi sentiments in the script were watered down. This is before World War II, after World War I. Yeah, I was going to say, so we're still at the time where we're like listening to that. Well, Germany has built back up to this world, the number one world power again. Right. And so and they're the the biggest cultural like uh, film. You know, they have German expressionism coming out. They're doing all this stuff. But at the same time, everything's kind of this dark storm is building. And so they had a lot of sway in Hollywood and then U.S. politics Mm -hmm. and really everywhere. I think people forget that how powerful and influential Germany was at this time. All you have to do is watch Cabaret. But also Universal had lost its main executives and two new ones had come in its place and wanting to prove themselves bowed to that pressure, thinking it was going to be too much money to eliminate. It's like China today saying no. And even now, Hollywood doesn't care sometimes. But you have to imagine Germany back then compared to China now was more, even more powerful and represented even more dollars internationally which is crazy to think about. That is, my God. And so they uh, they caved. And so they f- basically put James Whale aside, um, brought in a new director, reshot a lot of it, re-edited it, and it turned it into, and reshot it for comedy. We brought in a writer to, to add comedy into it. Oh. And so it lost all of its steam and gestalt, or whatever you want to call I probably shouldn't use that word. I was going to say, maybe that's not the best word to use. Something that's bigger than the sum of its parts. You know, the meaning and and the warning of it all. You know, know, I feel like Charlie Chaplin was able to do some better things, disguising things as comedies. And I think that's a little bit what they were maybe trying to make it do, like modern times or something like that. Yeah, but you have to have the right fucking director to do that kind of comedy. Yeah, and so they they fired this guy, you know, essentially. And so 
uh, it flopped and then they blamed him for it publicly they fired him yes so you know that's it sucks and so it's like really i i'm not really sure how much this has to do with him being gay i would say probably not a lot you know, I mean, because you hear a lot of stories from this this time. Maybe period. later on when he's trying to claw back and get newer projects again after code had happened, because this confluence of events was happening with the war and the code going through things like contracting into more conservativeness. You know, the nuclear family in the 1950s was starting to build up and, you know, so he kind of lost his steam. And after that loss was never really able to, to come back, crawl back. He canceled his contract with Universal, too. And this is back with those contract systems where you were attached to a studio. And if no other studio was comfortable with you, they weren't going to do it. Well, that system lasted for a very, very oh, yeah. long time in Hollywood. You know, I mean, that that entire system either like made or broke your career. It's fascinating. To, for anybody, like producers, directors, actors and actresses, like for real, like the, the system was for better or for worse. It churned out a, a lot of really good movies and created a lot of talent. But I mean, they were working these people to death yeah. sometimes. And sometimes for not great stuff. Yeah. And they they may have been paid or well or may not, you know, like some of these people just ended their careers and had next to nothing. Yeah. So I I feel like you're correct. I feel like. Being gay back then may or may not have been a secret for some of these people. But as we start to hear more stories about how Hollywood was back in this time, I feel like being openly gay amongst your peers, at least, was a lot more commonplace. Yes. Than now what we would realize. Now, even in like the 40s, 50s, it was started to, you know, obviously be the unspoken. Thing, yes. Right. And so by like Elizabeth Taylor's time, you know, and suddenly last summer's time and all that stuff. Right. So as we get into the fifties and sixties, it's not something that was shared or talked about or open. You could not be open anymore. No, you could not. And in fact, I mean, you had to be really, really careful how you disguised any sort of subtext in things. Yes. Right? It had to be the sissy sissification. Exactly. Versus actually being openly gay. Or like making them very, very villainous. Yeah. Right. We saw a lot of like gay villains between like 1950 and like 1970 or and even in later. every 1980s Disney movie. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, so you, you had to just be very careful about how you would do things. And I feel like movies like Bride of Frankenstein, you know, I he's able to have some sort of like gay subtext between like two characters. Right. Yes. In such a way. But, um, you, you would not have seen that if you were to start making movies toward the end of his life. Mm -hmm. Right. But I mean, it all comes down to dollars at the end of the day. And if a movie is a flop and doesn't make any money, it's too easy for someone to say like, no, you're out. Right. Yeah. I, I really don't buy that. There are too many people in Hollywood who were shocked at his, behavior or shocked at his lifestyle or anything like that I, he was openly gay like it was never a secret very openly gay out on set yep and with a longtime partner you know yep. so like that is not going to just ruin your career in one fucking day it's, you know? it's so hard for us at least for me to think of previous times as less conservative than even now mm -hmm. or something you know because my my a feeling like the arc of history is getting more progressive or something but maybe that's really only representative of the last like 80 years you know, but even then it's like pre-code, this was like manufactured conservatism, right? That kind of culminated in the, you know, um, you know, in the fifties, like built up to the fifties and then built down from the fifties to finally we were on the, on the other side of it, kind of in the, by the eighties, kind of, kind of, kind of, I mean, like we got almost out of it and then the AIDS crisis hit mm -hmm. <laughs> and then things like retracted again. At least and that's just case. from like a homosexual standpoint. Yeah, because we talked about what happened in the early 80s with like cruising. Right? Exactly. We were there. We were able to talk about it. We were able to like do it. Things were open and easy. And then AIDS happened and then like it contracted again. And I, I don't even know. I feel like even from today, I feel like there's... There's a lot of homophobia going, a lot of transphobia going along, right? I mean, laws are being created or trying to be created all the time to suppress homosexuals or anybody from the LGBT community. Well, they're not going to have a lot of luck doing that during times of pacifism. Because, like, if you look back at this history, things are happening, right? It's like everything was kind of open. This was after World War One, the Great War, which was just, like, shockingly catastrophic, yes. even compared to World War Two in some senses, right? And so then uh, things just kind of shut down and contracted with World War II again, you know, and it's like things got more and more and more liberal and it's like, okay, uh, we've seen every single big thing that happens. Society kind of contracts in on itself and becomes more conservative. 9-11, right? Patriot Act. 
all that stuff, the pandemic a little bit, you know? And so I don't know, something big will, would have to happen for the society to really successfully contract that much in my opinion. I mean, I would agree, but um, I don't know. I still feel like, I still feel like there's a lot of rampant homophobia today, like more than I would have thought like 15 years ago. I think there, you know, it's, it's weird because we were talking about this a little bit with, you know, um, the green room. Right. Yeah. And a couple of other things that we've seen recently, which is like the Nazis, you know, the people that are willing to, to be Nazis, like they're always there. The homophobes, they're there. It's just how much in politics and in culture, is it okay for them to actually make themselves known? Yeah. Well, right? for that to, to have a voice or there's somebody out there representing We're thinking them. a whole bunch of racists yeah. just got, you know, racists just got created when Trump was president. No, no, it just made them, it just gave them a soapbox. It gave them a microphone. Mm-hmm. They were always there. You know, I don't think a lot of people are getting converted with these, with these things. I think it's just the microphone is getting passed to different groups that we thought were gone or silenced because we never heard from them. That's true. I, and that's I also, why representation matters. <laughs> I mean, for real. And there, there's a lot. There's a lot of representation. I was thinking about this movie, and I'm sure that we'll talk about it in a minute. But I was just like, I don't know that this movie is very empowering for me as a gay man, like watching it. Yeah. Like I said, it's kind of an apologistic, apologist view, you know. And and we'll get into that a little bit, I think, when we get into more of the themes. But making this movie, we need to discuss the actual people behind making it. And we're going to talk about the, the actual gods and monsters. Yeah, yeah, the actual gods and monsters movie, right? Um, and we did a little bit, obviously, and we will continue. But uh, this is directed by Bill Condon. And so it's just like there's a lot of names around this movie. It's like where you've heard of them, but you maybe you don't know exactly what they've done. Bill Condon sounds familiar, right? He did the first sequel of Candyman, Fear World of the Flesh, right? Mm-hmm. He was the writer for Chicago. Yep. And he wrote and directed Kinsey, Dreamgirls. He directed Twilight, the Twilight Saga, Breaking Dawn, Part 1 and 2, randomly. He did Mr. Holmes with Ian McKellen. He did Beauty and the Beast, the new live-action remake. The Greatest Showman, he was a writer. And The Good Liar, which my mom has told me I need to see for a couple years now, and it keeps reminding me, and it's on my letterboxed must-watch list. And so that is uh, starring also Ian McKellen, but with Helen Mirren. I have not even heard of that movie. Yeah, I, I need to see it. It's supposed to be a really good like talky thriller, you know, and oh, really those two actors. Oh, fuck. Yeah. I can't even imagine. Right. Talk about Bill Condon. Yeah. Bill Condon's done a lot. He really has like, like and- what a gay fucking filmography. That is Kinsey, Kinsey, Kinsey Chicago, Chicago, dream Chicago. girls, twilight beauty and the beast <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing is that every time every time i see his name attached to a movie i'm like that's gay as fuck oh i can't wait to watch that you know what i mean yeah. i mean he makes good movies kinsey is an amazing movie i love it yeah I've, I've never seen the sequel to Candyman. i don't think i've seen it i don't think it's terrible that one reviewer called it like inept or Schlocky unintelligent or schlocky i thought it was good you know i thought it was very good actually yeah and i, I don't know that i'm overly fond of breaking dawn twilight stuff but i didn't dislike the twilight are. movies i mean they, they were no, fine competently made yeah uh i just not really my bag dream girls though is a really really good fucking musical it's a good movie musical it's a good movie it's yes i yeah. I, I really really like dream girls actually yeah i like chicago i for i forgot who directed rob marshall directed chicago right yeah i guess yeah. so but he wrote I mean, he didn't write the play though so it's like i guess he wrote the script or translated it to screen i was like well, why and there is a huge translation from stage to screen in that because all the musical numbers are sort of like in people's heads they don't really happen in real life it so that neat. director had never directed a film before mm-hmm. he did chicago and he won the fucking oscar for it yeah right and so it's like why why didn't bill condon just do it maybe he wasn't you know thinking that he could do it i don't mm-hmm. know he did dream girls maybe he was working his way toward dream girls he was just saving it he didn't want to blow his love with chicago he wanted Beyonce. It was Beyonce or nothing. Have you seen The Greatest Showman? I have not. Me but either. people love it. People do. I when I when I when a, a movie musical comes out, I like it to be based on another like an existing property. If it's an original movie musical, I'm less likely to watch it. Yeah. Also, I don't like Hugh Jackman as singer. I don't really care for Hugh Jackman. Period. Oh, so I like him as Wolverine, Me even though Wolverine's right. not my favorite character. I, that's all he really does. But I mean, like Bill Condon, he, he's had a really good career. He's going to continue to have a good career. He makes good movies. He has an eye for film. He has an eye for like epic kind of like musical things. Like everything he does is on yeah. a grand scale. I want to see The Good Liar. I definitely want to see that now. Now I'm adding that to my list. I didn't even know it existed. For real. My mom literally just told me the other day and I didn't realize. 
and we were looking it up and Matt was like, Oh, that's by the same director as good liar. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so this is just the universe telling me to watch my mom's suggestions. She, she's the one that originally made me watch uh, the lion in winter. I remember that. She loves character. really good dialogue, like witty dialogue. And so. Well, and I also appreciate shit like that. So, I mean. Yeah. And you think of Catherine Hepburn with uh, Richard Harris, mm-hmm. you know, and like, what is the analogy of that today? Like Ian McKellen, Helen Mirren. You know? I would. I can Hell. already fucking like picture it in my brain a little bit. The thing is, every time my mom mentions something to me, she's like, you should watch this movie. My first thought is it's probably trash. Yes, me too. But if <laughs> so, I if actually look at it objectively, like I don't like watching other movies people suggest to me. I like it to be my idea. I think everyone's kind of the same way. Yeah, of course. You know what I mean? Like you want to discover something. On but if I think own. about it objectively, I'm like, what do I average rate on like on Letterboxd? Everything that my, my mom has made me watch like four, 4.5 shit. You know, I'm going to fucking enjoy it. <laughs> I you mean, know? you should probably start listening to your mother more often. Now, if I look at what my mom tells me to watch objectively, it's like Trash. two, three stars. <laughs> so I'm like, I should continue to never accept her invitation to go to the, the theater. Right. <laughs> No, she she watches good movies. My mom likes good films. I took her to see The Women. She's like telling you to see like made for TV sequels to like Black Beauty or something. Well, I mean, she's always talking about watching Yellowstone or whatever the fuck is on oh, TV. That, they're telling me to watch 1883 and Yellowstone. Yeah, my mom loves that shit too. And I was just like, Mom, I'm not in my 60s yet. I'll watch that later on in life. I don't really <laughs> care to watch it right now. Sorry. It's, it's almost as good as Lonesome Dove. <laughs> <laughs> Those are dumb, actually a really good mini series. <laughs> but okay. We have digressed. <laughs> oh, we keep all this in. <laughs> so Clive Barker. <laughs> Another important gay. Yes. So on Clive Barker randomly executive producing, he said, quote, Whale was gay. I'm gay. Whale was English. I'm English. Whale made some horror movies. I've made some horror movies. It seemed as if I should be helping to tell his story. I mean, yeah. I don't know how that happened. There's nothing I can read out there that says, like, did he, like, reach, he heard this project was happening and wanted to help produce it? Did he get it off the ground? I, I don't know. Yeah. Did he, like, read the book or whatever? And he was just like, hey. Maybe, you know, maybe, uh, obviously he put some money into it, you know, so. I mean, and when watching this movie and seeing his name in the credits, I was just like, the fuck? Mm-hmm. I was like, Clive Barker? Really? Is it the same Clive Barker? So Matt I looked, yeah. was like, was that Clive Barker in the credits? I'm like, no. Let's rewind it just in case. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'm like, pulled up IMDb immediately. And I was like, same one. My God. But yeah, that was shocking to me. But I mean, like, it makes sense for him to try to tell this story. It does. Because like, yeah. it's like, it, it, it probably for some of these people, they're looking at this and they're like, this is important. His legacy is important. Getting his work, his artistic intent, not as that monster movie guy, but that clever art- artur that was actually trying to tell a story yeah. and interesting and and you know, in good and important way kind of director, you know, who did a lot more than just horror too, you know? And so it's like maybe Clive Barker's interested in maybe getting a fair shake for his own legacy, you know, well, and some other true. people like him. Or and maybe it's just like we were talking about like art begetting art. Also, right? you know, a fucking queen. <laughs> for real. Um, but I mean, art begetting art, you have to go back and at least like pay some dues or pay respect to the things that influence you yeah. in some way. And I'm sure that Clive Barker growing up saw a lot of James Wells movies and maybe made a connection between his life and, you know, his own. And yeah, you would want to tell that kind of a story. If you're passionate about something like that and throw yeah. some dollars at it at the very least. Right. And nothing about this movie feels like Clive Barker. Right. So, but that's fine. Another thing that really shocked me about this movie was the music. Because yeah. I'm usually a fairly good like film score aficionado. I would say that you are far more than just that. So, I mean, I've heard of Carter Burwell, just like I've heard of Bill Condon, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so this guy is prolific. He did like Raising Arizona, the Buffy the Vampire Slayer movie, Airheads, Rob Roy, Fargo, The Big Lebowski, Bing John Dalkovich, A Knight's Tale, Kinsey, No Country for Old Men, Twilight... A Serious Man, True Grit, Three Billboards Outside of Ebbing, Missouri, The Good Liar, Tragedy of Macbeth, etc., etc. Obviously, a big partner of his, you know, oh, the Cohen. Is this director is Bill Condon, as well as the Cohen brothers. Yeah. Right? And it's like, why do I not know this? Because I was listening to this soundtrack in isolation while I was, like, doing the notes and this, writing the synopsis and, and things like that. And it was really fucking good. It's a really good score. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I noticed a little bit during the movie, right? And it's a little repetitive, but it's just like, uh, I love how they tied it with the violin playing in Bride of Frankenstein and, and such. And so I, um, I listened to it in isolation and it was really, really good. And I was just like, who's Carter Burwell? I've heard that so much, but I just don't have any of his stuff in my library. You know what I mean? That Racing Arizona score, though, my God. I need to listen to it then. It's, I mean, I can hear it right now, like watching that movie. That's it's, why I say I'm a pseudo aficionado because I have big blind spots, obviously. Yeah, but when it comes to that sort of thing, like you're way more well versed than I am. You know, because I, I rarely ever notice the scores in movies and I didn't really notice it in this one, right? It's not until I listen in a vacuum that I can appreciate stuff like that. Still, I'll get stuff from people. Like, I was a huge um, Phil Glass fan for different reasons like his work on Pawakatsi and mm-hmm. all this other stuff and then of course his, his private works that I love so much like Metamorphosis and things like that and then like you told me like your favorite score of all time or one of them was The oh, Hours The Hours is so good which I'd heard and I'd seen that movie and then I went back and listened to Hours in Isolation and I'm like Jesus fuck it's amazing that is a good fucking score that is like, one of my favorites great now score. Too. like Philip Glass is a good film composer oh yeah right? for sure except for that Fantastic Four score that he did right <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like I, some of these movies, now that we're talking about them, you know, I can I, I recognize pieces of music from them. Raising Arizona, for sure. Big Lebowski. Yes, definitely. Like Twilight. Yeah. I mean, because I listen to those soundtracks a lot before the pop songs, but the, the score sound it's like snuck in on you. I mean, obviously, he's doing really competent work where you might not necessarily come out whistling its theme like you would like John Williams or something. A little bit with Twilight, maybe, on some of those themes. You know, obviously, in this, there's a theme. There's a light motif. Mm -hmm. uh, Raising Arizona, for sure. Yeah. You know, but some of these others, like, I don't know, a serious man. I I can't remember. No Country for Old Men. Kenzie. A Knight's Tale. My memory of music from that is all the pop music they used, which was genius, by the way. Yes. So Well, and I would be interested to know if this man has been nominated for an Oscar or not. I mean, because these are like really big movies that were nominated for lots and lots of Oscars. Yeah, I don't know. So I, I don't remember the scores for these movies being nominated for anything. Certainly not three billboards, you know, and that yeah. was nominated for a, a lot. But I don't know. I mean, I would like to go back and listen to this because I'm sure that the music was really, really good. I think I was just kind of wrapped up in the performances of it all, mm-hmm. right? I have only seen this movie one other time and it's when it came out, you know, so this is my second rewatch, my my first rewatch of this movie. I probably saw it sometime in the early thousands, maybe, maybe earlier. I mean, I, it came out when I was working in video stores and I was like, Oh, this one that I keep hearing everything about. I was nominated for Oscars. Let me watch it. You know? And I, I liked it a lot and I liked it a lot this time too. Yeah. But I, I can't remember either time thinking like the score for this is amazing. So I just need to go back and listen to it. Well, speaking of music, we've got some themes. <laughs> <laughs> that was really fucking good. That was a masturbate piece for sure. <laughs> so I just wrote down some notes and I'm just like, it's hard talking about themes kind of sometimes when you're talking about a biopic, someone's yeah. real life, because it's like, is there themes to someone's life? Like this would be like a work of art or a movie. And it's like, maybe not necessarily, but it's, it's more of a question of what is this movie interested in? Well, right? and I think that's, for this particular biopic, a lot of it is not real, <laughs> you know? Like, some of it, yeah. yeah a lot of it is, though. I mean, like, the man is real, but some of the things that happen in this movie are just not. That's true. So, so I feel like one of the themes is changing your stars, right? Rags to riches, right? And this guy definitely did that. For sure. I feel like Brendan Fraser's character does that by That's the end true. of the movie. So it's kind of like the American dream, except James Whale was not American. He ended up in America. Right. But he lifted his bootstraps for the most part, you know, going to World War One and... You know, and his survival afterwards and getting into art and just like being true to himself and artistic integrity is also another theme of, of his life is really just tr- trying to stick true to himself and not bowing to pressure and getting out of the system when he didn't like it anymore. I think what's really important here to talk about is like you're talking about like um, he he became an artist in Britain, right? He he created art. He created stage yeah. plays and things like that. It's when he came to America that he became famous, yes. right? And well, so, he also got the the chance to direct pictures. He, he wasn't doing that in England at all. No, uh, but they probably. Well, I don't know. How he was time. asked after Broadway to translate it to film, and that's how he started his film career and moved to Hollywood. And he was making art in America, but you know, just like America, 
it's it's all about profits and things like that. So I mean, like, would he have been as successful? It's kind of like a Rob Marshall story, actually, because Rob Marshall had only done plays. That's true. My oh, God, more similarities. We need more yarn. <laughs> <laughs> But he does. I mean, like he gets to America, he makes some money, he gets to live his life in a certain way. And then it's all kind of taken away from him again at the end. Yeah. Right. It's incredibly sad. So uh, speaking of sad, I mean, there's also elements of PTSD in this, right? Certainly from World War One, yeah. losing his friends and lovers and talking about them in some way, seeing them in the trenches. Trench warfare sucks. I mean, you're looking at your friend's body for weeks sometimes. Right. That's right. And this particular one, his potential lover that he refers to was like strung up right and so they kind of have to make it almost into a comedy a little bit like better you than me poor chap you know Mm -hmm. you know but it sucks i mean you have to go through that and then later when things normalize you have to go back and you have to deal with it so normalizing death from that you know abstract concept that we all mostly live with and into uh and then turning them into actual themes and unworkable ideas within his art obviously things like frankenstein and ride of frankenstein For being sure. able to like philosophize these concepts into bits of tragedy and comedy i think that's very much present in his work right and mm-hmm. then like some of these flashbacks or some of these fantasies that he has in his head because i mean it's not quite a flashback because i i get the idea that he's remembering things in the way that he wants no, to and i kept wanting them to be shot better too they were shot so staged I'm okay with that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Cause like a lot of the, like a lot of the leading into things where they have like that, that tree in the background and it's like Frankenstein. Right. You know what I mean? And it yeah. turns out to be him and Brendan Fraser. Right. Yeah. Like I'm okay with the way that it was staged. Cause it sort of like harkens back to the way that things were kind of shot. Yeah. Like, I'm at the world war one scenes. I mean, even the way that the, the trenches are kind of shot, it's still very dreamlike and very fantasy. like, yeah. Right. So, I mean, it's, it's less of a flashback and more of like, an actual memory, right? So I'm, I like that. Actually. Yeah, I, I, I just I guess I wanted a little bit more. Like today, you know, we get all of this like visual representation of what something is supposed to, to feel or look like, right? Mm. So like we get stuff like World War II stuff or World War One stuff. Things have a sepia tone. The colors are washed out a little bit because it reminds us of the photographs we see. You know, all of that stuff that just is visual shorthand, visual storytelling for. To get us faster to a setting or time or place. And so they, that wasn't done here. It was done very literally going into his memory. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and I, we weren't given that like white death vignette on the edges <clears throat> either. You know, there was nothing about it that was distinct from reality. No, you're you're absolutely right. I just, I there's a moment where he was talking about his lover, right? And he's sort of like holding his face in the trench, right? They're standing next to each other, like looking at the the sunrise or something like that. Oh, that scene was actually pretty filmic. I mean, it's yeah. like, like I when mean, he turns around and the sun's behind him and it's like this perfect chiseled, you know, apple cheeked, whatever <laughs> apple cheeked youth. Yeah. It's lava. Yeah. But I was just like, Oh my goodness. Like it was so striking. A swoon. Yeah. yeah. So I, and just, that was, um, Todd Babcock playing Leonard Barnett. Theoretically. I don't know how real that relationship is. It was alluded from like memoirs or something, but, or could have been made up. I, I mean, I, I really don't know. But I mean, just like that moment where he's has his narration in the background, he's talking about his experience and we get to see maybe not, ex- certainly not exactly how it was when he was there, but the way that he's remembering it at that fucking moment. Like, yeah. It's just so fucking poignant. To the me. intercut is good. The editing. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, oh my God, I really love that part of the movie. But there's also PTSD about being gay and getting older and less about being gay. He's very matter of fact and comfortable with the fact that he's gay. Oh yeah. He's made peace of being gay. And I feel like he's always had that in a way. And like once he had gotten over the judgment from his father, he didn't care about anyone else's judgment. Nope. You know? And so it's like, I thought, you know, can one have PTSD from nostalgia, from having good memories from the past? So like almost like a reverse trauma, but living in a void in the present. So that contrast, right? It's like you have this horrible moment of near death and then you have a time of peace afterwards and your brain is trying to get out of that cycle of death, right? That's PTSD in a way Mm -hmm. versus like maybe the opposite is also true. It's like you had such a, a wonderful time of being out and comfortable and gay and having a career and making movies with friends and all this stuff. And then now your life, I mean, this is something a lot of people go through in old age. I mean, the highest suicide rate is with older people, right? Where you have like that PTSD of like present traumatic disorder or something of you have this void in your life. There's this sense of everything's over. I've passed everything. Everything's behind me now. There's only horror and tragedy in front of me, right? Or is that just called clinical depression? It's a combination of both, yeah. I think. 
And that also feeds into his, you know, thinking about his legacy and his artistic integrity from that standpoint. I think most of the movie stems from that. If all I have left is memory, then what is people's memory of me? That's, oh my God, that's so fucking deep. Jesus Christ. But that's that movie. Yeah. I mean, this is this is this movie in a nutshell, right? I mean, ultimately, he wants to remember the things that he's done, even though he kind of dismisses them sometimes to people. But yeah. I mean, when Brendan Fraser's character, Clayton, is like, oh, your movie's on TV tonight. And he's like, oh, is it? You know? And then we see like him actually watching it that night on TV with Hannah, right? Like he he wants to remember, he wants to relive the things that he has done, and he still wants to create, and he's frustrated by it. He's frustrated by everything in his life, yeah. right? Like his longtime lover is not living with him anymore. Like he is reduced to kind of like toying with people to come over to interview him and things like that. Yeah. Right. And I mean, he is just doing what he can to sort of have fun or entertain himself when all he wants to do is draw. Yeah. But, or get a sexual thrill, obviously, you know, people are sexual to the day they die, you know, to a certain extent. I think it has less to do with him wanting to get a sexual thrill with him actually creating something. I think it's both. I mean, I, I think I it's okay for it to be both. It's okay for it to be both. I feel like he was attracted to Clayton for sure, for sure. you know, but I feel like ultimately it was more about, Having companionship, having someone like to respark some of that artistic nature. Well, in he him. was also very open about that with the journalist at the beginning of the film. He mm-hmm. was like, "Okay, your questions aren't interesting to me anymore. That's right. So let's make this worth my while. That's right. Let's make it more interesting. And for I just me. don't give a shit about just going through the motions here. I don't have that much time left. I'm in bad health. Mm-hmm. Take off your goddamn shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that that's kind of segues us into um, you know a little bit of that sexual harassment stuff. I just want to say that, first of all, I hope that I'm that kind of older gay guy. You know what I mean? Like, take your shot. off. But not in a predatory kind of way. <laughs> yeah, they're skirting a line here. There's some gray area, right? And so, like, there's some weird, you know, pound me too. Well, I guess just to say, <laughs> hashtag me too. Yeah. Moments here with sexual harassment, right? And it's like, certainly after talking about Brian Singer. Yeah. And certainly after all of that hashtag me too stuff that we've all lived through, you know, it's like, how do we feel about this? Did whale or people like him pass the baton to other predator gays, such as like Brian Singer and Kevin Spacey? Uh, or is this just male power in Hollywood and what that looks like? Do we need to lump him in that predator category? I don't, I don't know. This doesn't seem to be coming from repression of being gay or exerting his power. He doesn't have any power and he has no repression for being gay, but merely loneliness and curiosity you know, an impatience. There doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence of predatory behavior at the height of his notoriety or power, especially because he had nothing to hide being out of the closet pre-code. And certainly when he's older, he's just bored. He is and so I don't bored. know if I'm making excuses for him because what he does at the end of Brendan Fraser is wrong, but in a way almost makes an excuse of, I only did this to you so that you'd kill me. You know, as, I don't know. There's a weird gray area here. There is. And, and I'm, I'm, com- I'm comfortable. It is. It's uncomfortable to talk about and to think about. I, but I feel like I don't know. Choices were made at the end of this movie for both of these characters. Right. It's cringy, right? And so it's like let's let's say like we watched that and it was an older white guy uh, talking to doesn't even have to be white um, talking to a woman and doing that to them. You know, we would we would see that scene a little bit a little bit more predatory, right? And so really, the actions are the same, the dialogue is the same, the genders are swapped. Like, it really shouldn't be any different. Like, it's wrong. I mean, it is. And I I don't know. I, I think mostly I have a hard time, like, comparing this to, to Brian Singer's actions or supposed right. actions. Because right. I feel like Brian Singer was using his power. Yes. And also, uh, allegedly. And that Brian Singer was allegedly, you know, kind of more underspoken under the radar a little bit compared to James Whale. Certainly Kevin Spacey was more under the radar and used that, I think, to his advantage. Used his power and understated, you know, the held the secret almost like it was a weapon, like daring people to to, to out him or something, you know? And if we're going to go based on what this movie is presenting to us about James Wells past, right? Especially that scene where he's reminiscing about the pool parties at his house, right? All the men there seem to be clearly of age. 
you know? Yeah, of course. And they had chose to be there. They're like, come watch me dive and things like that. Like these people wanted to be in that situation. It's just kind of a sick situation though, because if you think about that today or even 30 years ago or any time really, when you're dealing with the people that are taking for granted, even sometimes their own power, let alone the people that are using it as a weapon, the people that don't understand their own power, right? And so they're inviting all of the interns and all of the new actors trying to get gigs and stuff like that and putting them in a situation where they think they're going to get an edge ahead or a, a shoe in for taking their top off or giving you a quick handy or something like that's just a bad situation right like, yeah. all the way around and the people are like oh they did it from their own free will they didn't know you have the power they see you you don't understand how they see you you could think of any manager employee relationship today a lot of uh, employees you know, if their manager says something, they're going to obsess over something they said. Their manager has no clue that they were obsessing over one sentence they said to him in passing, you know? I mean, it's I because of the power they wield and they take that for granted. Yeah. I mean, and that is true. So I don't know. I mean, it's interesting to think. And I would like to know more about James Wells' past. And I wish that there was some things to find that there's was nothing hearsay, to indicate you know? that he was a predator. There's, yeah. there's, there's nothing there. I don't know if there was because of the time, but he everything signifies that he was out, had nothing to hide. Right. Which means everyone already knew. And so if people were uncomfortable. They could stay away. You know, he kind of drew his boundaries out around him. Yeah. And I don't know. I feel like the way that he treated Brendan Fraser at the end of this movie, a like it's really that was like the scariest part in the movie is when like you have that POV of through that gas mask or whatever. Like Brendan Fraser really has no idea what's going on. Right? Yeah. And it also shows how sensitive he was because he was about to kill him and he didn't didn't want to do that. He yeah. wasn't the type of person to, he's not a violent person by nature. And I mean, he like, kind of acts that way. He always had that box of, I'm going to protect my masculinity because that's all I've got, you know, and I'm going to beat you with it because you were a little bit too handsy. descriptive with how oh, you described yeah. your past, you know, being gay or whatever. And all he was doing is saying guys were walking around naked or whatever and having pool parties and blah, 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 you know? And so he's uncomfortable with that. And then later, but he's like still interested in James Whale as a person. But he still has to put all that pretense forward as part of his toxic masculinity. Pardon the phrase. It's all we've got to work with, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, and I feel like the, during that day when they had gone to the, the Princess Margaret party and, you know, they were they were building a connection. It was the first time they were alone in the house and they were really starting to have rapport. And he made himself very, very vulnerable to James Whale, right? Yep. Like, let's try to rekindle something, you know, f- for your art. And at the end, we understand why, because he's weeping. He's like yeah. literally weeping thinking about what he could have done, you know, and also having been put in that situation and all of his like walls coming down because of it. And it's horrific that he was put in that situation, but also kind of freeing in a weird way. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's weird. It's, it's, it's like, didn't really quite get me where I wanted to go in a kind of any kind of pure way or, you know, poignant way to tell a story about end of life or Brendan Fraser coming to terms with his own sexuality or, sensibilities or even just tolerance or tolerance or, you know it's just kind of muddied the muddy the, the water is a little muddy here yeah oh because well, there's just not a clear because I mean, it's a real life and real life is muddy well that, and that's true i mean it's a biopic right so yeah but i don't know i feel like i feel like the entire movie closes well, let's just say it's a biopic that's not trying to you know canonize whoever they're covering you know no right because we can get biopics that are turning people into saints or something, you know? <laughs> yes. Uh, seen- as much as I love Schindler's list, it was very kind to Schindler. That's true. And I mean, I feel like this movie is maybe, I don't know. I mean, cause they, they fictionalize part of his life, right? I've never read this book. You know, I don't, I don't know, but well, it's a lot to think about. It is, it is. And it's a lot. And so that's kind of why I wanted to end there. Although we did have some notes on homophobia, right? And we mentioned, this is almost an apologist view of, James Whale being gay and that being part of a big part of his story. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I'm feeling like Brendan Fraser is only here because he's the audience. He's the audience's way in to Whale's story for the nineties audience. Right. Which is like, Oh, Brendan Fraser, this masculine guy that's working the land, you know, his whore to culturalist, <laughs> whatever he is. Um, and he can deal with it. And he utters the words live and let live. As long as you're not too gay around me, you know, he seemed to be the attitude at the time, the societal attitude at the time. Don't ask, don't tell, yeah. you know? And so they, there's a little bit too much telling and the boundaries come out and the toxic masculinity has kind of pr- protect itself. 
you know, and so that that's the boundaries that we're dealt with. And then we can go a little bit further. But I feel like if those boundaries from the 90s or any other time where there was like a lot of rife homophobia in the air, you know, or in law or the things or in code, literally, mm. like uh, then this story would have been a little bit more pure and we could have actually talked about James Whale as a person a little bit more than through the lens of Brendan Fraser's homophobia. I feel like this movie would be made a lot differently today. Yes. Very, very much. Like, I feel like if they made this exact movie today... Or wrote the book. Yeah. Even differently. I feel like if they made this movie today with this this character being as you know like homophobic-ish as he is, right? Or sometimes blatantly homophobic... I don't think that it would fly or come across as well. It, it takes it almost spends too much time saying, yes, he's gay. This is why he's uncomfortable. This is why you're uncomfortable. We're going to make it a little cringy to for, you know, some validation for the audience. And it's like we don't need any of that shit today. We're going to have the maid talk about how he's going to hell. But Let's at the end of the movie, on. like saying, yeah. you know, I love you. I respect you. We're going to put you back in the pool and I'm sorry for it. You know, like the fucking flop his body in there like it's, you yeah. know, like a whale. <laughs> Well, I don't like is a fucking pool toy or something. Yeah, he is floating there like a floaty. Do you have any fun facts for me? I kind of do, which are not, I mean, they're more informative than fun. Why do you keep saying that for every episode we do? Because I like the funny fun facts, the shocking (laughs) ones. And we've kind of had a dearth of shocking fun facts. No, okay, there have been, but they have still been fun. So let me have them. Okay. So James Whale had several men and women pose nude for him in real life. And some of those are shown in the making of featurette. Several of his paintings were actually uh, bought by a collector and loaned to the studio for the making of the film. So I have the DVD of this movie. Okay. But I do not have a DVD player anymore. Oh, so I have all these featurettes at some point. If you were going to have a Blu-ray player. No. Wow. Okay. Isn't that sad? Did, oh. all the, they're all sitting proudly on my shelf. Oh. I just have no vessel in which to play them. <laughs> whale suffered from strokes towards the end of his life which affected his mental abilities and he was found dead in his pool mm-hmm. there were rumors that this was a homicide but the evidence only pointed at suicide who would have killed him i don't know i do want to know maybe that. a stilted um, toxic <clears throat> masculine lover mayhaps don't mayhaps know. an interviewer Ooh. Mm. mayhaps hannah mayhaps hannah in mayhaps david dukes who knows someone with the gas mask. I don't know. I think it's widely believed that he committed suicide. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, in the documentary included on the DVD and in the interviews, novelist Christopher Bram explains that the character of Clayton Boone is completely fictitious. Yes, yes, he is. He, he is, is the vehicle, right? Yeah. He is the audience. He may have been an amalgam of different things, but he was made up for this movie. This person did not exist. It is clearly just some sort of dramatic element. Right. And then, of course, he is the audience again at the end where he's like, I'm appreciating James Whale and what he stood for. Blah, blah, blah. I'm going to stand out in the rain and reminisce and walk like the monster. So what a happy ending to this sad film. And weirdly forced. Uh (laughs) (laughs) It's almost like he was directed. Right. So Sir Ian McKellen obviously said that he felt very comfortable playing the role of James Whale. Like Whale, McKellen is a homosexual British actor who spent his early career in the theater and ultimately started a career in Hollywood. Oh my God, they're one and the same. Oh my God. <clears throat> so this movie was shot in only 24 days. Jesus. Filming began on June 30th, 1997 in Pasadena, California, and principal photography was completed on July 28th, 1997. In Pasadena? In Pasadena. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, well, there's not a lot to this movie. It's a period piece, obviously, but couldn't, yeah, it doesn't seem very periody. Yeah, it, well, I was noticing that goddamn car that Clayton r- rides in on his truck. Oh, that truck! Yeah. Also, what is his cars? The movie the, <laughs> is that Mater <laughs> and the fucking lawnmower. Yeah, I was like, what is that? And then I was seeing his edger, his manual edger, and I was yeah. like, Jesus Christ, that would be so fucking difficult these days. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Didn't you have that manual lawnmower at one I point? I did. I did for a time. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, well, that's cute. I was like, that's <laughs> going to give me muscles. <laughs> and I was just like, good luck with all of that. Used it like three times. Yeah. Modern convenience. Because you have to sharpen that shit. And I was like, nope. <laughs> no, no. I just want to pull a cord. But yeah, I can see how this movie was shot in a very quick amount of time. Like <clears throat> the principal actors are the principal actors. It's a small else. cast yeah. in like only like three locations. I mean, it seemed like an easy movie to make yeah. kind of. Well, it was made for $10 million. Until you start thinking about the big party scene and then maybe like... Um, oh, the big party scene the and the Bride of Frankenstein one. scene and the World of the Trenches. Yeah, yeah. They spent all the money on, on those dream sequences. On the sets. Memory, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
So, finally, the weirdness that of Ian McKellen, Lynn Redgrave, and Brendan Fraser, all three have been nominated for Academy Awards, but only one of them has won. That's crazy. Brendan Fraser. That is crazy. Not crazy. Like, I'm not trying to dig on Brendan Fraser, but no. Ian fucking McKellen. I mean, Ian McKellen should have won an Oscar by now. And a Redgrave? You should just give Redgrave's fucking Oscars. They should come, come out, out of, the, out of the, womb. the womb holding an Oscar. <laughs> Thank you. Like, for real. My God. Howard's End. All the Redgraves need to, like, be given things. Trinkets. Vanessa Redgrave's work in Deep Impact was just <laughs> the best. <laughs> Was she a deep impact? Yes. She played the mother that had to kill herself. <gasps> They're trying. Because she didn't get into the lottery of the survivors of the comet or whatever the fuck. I really want to watch Deep Impact again. I haven't seen that, that movie That score in so is so long. good. I just like hear it and I just like start weeping. That movie makes me bawl. I know. It's such a good movie. Oh my God. Let's get really stoned and watch Deep Impact. For real. I don't know if I can cry when I'm that stone though. Oh, I certainly can. Anyway, but she was excellent as Guinevere in Camelot. I really Richard love Harris. her. In, and Franco uh, Nero. Howard's End. She's just fucking amazing yeah. in that movie. She's a revelation. Well, she's great. Yes. She's like the British Jane Fonda, really. Mm-hmm. You think about all the shit she was doing in the 60s, too. Yeah. Lynn is also good. Yes, Lynn is great. <laughs> well, if you if you think about it, it was her and Lynn uh, who did the remake of Whatever Happened to Baby Jane TV movie. I didn't know. Oh, my God. We did talk about that, didn't we, yeah. at some point? I've never seen that. Real Life Sisters playing those parts. Oh, I, we should watch that, too. Yes. Uh, Look at us. We're just adding all these things to our watch list, like all of James Whale's movies and then all the Red Graves is. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a couple of Brendan Fraser's. I do own them all on DVD now. That's true. Except for Monkey Bone and Whale. Oh. Yeah. But you're about to see the whale. That's right. And all of its splendor. Well, we have some questions to ask about gods and monsters, like we do about every movie we mm. cover on the mm. Film Flamers. And we're going to start with, uh, is gods and monsters a horror movie? No. No, it's not. It's about horror movies, kind of ish. Yeah. It's about people who love horror movies or people who love people who love horror. And movies. there's the adjacency, right? It's about horror. It's about a horror yeah. director, a famous one, the famous, you know, one of the first, the most important horror directors. Yes. And I mean, there's some real life horror going on in this. Yes. And it touches right? on some of the, the meaning behind the horror in Bride of Frankenstein. And That's right. So, and why why one would create horror. Yeah. Yes. So, so, I mean, there's there's some adjacency, but no, this is not a horror. The movie. connection is there. So, whatever. You More have yarn. a backlog of real horror movies, if that's what you want to listen Listeners, to. Listeners, send us yarn. We need it. We told you that. 120 minutes into this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Were you scared while watching Gods and Monsters? No. No. <laughs> we have to ask um i, I was, was cringing yeah that. for several th- i mean like okay the part where he puts that mask on him is kind of scary like the, the shocking stormy night yeah the shocking look of like it's raining and thundering outside you have that mask which is already frightening for historic reasons right yeah um on his naked body he's freaking out james is freaking out and doing weird things you know like that's kind of the scariest moment in this movie and mostly it's just really uncomfortable yeah so but not scary yeah. uh out of five stars what would you rate gods and monsters i'm waffling between a three and a half and a four waffling yes because I feel like without this, this lattice work of, you know, apologist gay subtext here, like I I feel like this would be a much better film and more poignant and more fair to James Whale. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. Uh, but I still give this movie four stars. Okay. I think it's really well made. I, I feel like the, the acting in this movie alone deserves four stars. Um, I feel like Ian McKellen is just fucking superb yeah. in this movie. And I, I really, I enjoyed watching it. I've only seen it. Like I said, this is the second time. And I just, I liked it both times that I watched the movie. It's so weird to think of him and after people and in this role playing both of these roles yeah. and only 57 years old. That is ridiculous. Yeah. I had no idea. I guess I've always just thought that Ian McKellen is just ancient at this point. Cause he seemed old then he looked old. He did. And they, of course, didn't help out by making him look older, yeah. you know, and he gave him bright white hair this time and a little bit more classical. But he did look older and apt pupil than this. Yes, I would agree. And Hired. then, of course, he plays an ancient wizard or whatever. <laughs> they made right. him look a little younger for, for uh, Magneto. Yeah, I really mean, because his hair was sh- short and he was kind of like a strapping supervillain or whatever, you know, but... But yeah. he looked a little, I mean, he's like a little haggard, you know, for his age, you know, which is fine because it, it, it adds character and, and, you know, classical look to him, you know. 
it adds a gravitas to his performance and the weight that he has on screen versus now he does look like a goddamn raisin (laughs) (laughs) jesus So finally, <laughs> but I love him. I do love it. We both love him, but you are absolutely correct. Who's the hottest guy in Gods and Monsters? You know, I was going to say Brendan Fraser because he's almost never at his hottest than he is right here. Yeah. You know, but I, I just got so swoony with that. Um, the storytelling and the voiceover of Ian McKellen talking about his pseudo lover from world war one in the trenches. And that was um, Todd Babcock playing Leonard Barnett from world war one. I'm going with Brendan Fraser okay. for real, because That's the more obvious, yeah. you know, less contrarian pick, obviously. Well, cause I was watching this movie and I have never, I've never been one to think that Brendan Fraser is super attractive. Right. I, I just mostly find him goofy and that's the characters yeah, that he's playing kind of is his body is perfect in this movie. Like props to him for the work that it took to, to, yeah. to look that great, you know, but um, I still have to say like, I didn't swoon for him. Like I did for Todd Babcock. I mean, I would totally like be throwing pool parties for Brendan Fraser in this. I'm, I don't know. I mean, like he's just super good looking. And mm-hmm. I think mostly it's because like, I, you're right. This is his peak hotness. I've never in anything else that I've seen him in gone. Wow. He's a really attractive man. If he grew a beard. Yeah. He could get it. Oh, wow. Oh, I can picture it right now in my head. <laughs> it's giving me like younger, you know, Kurt from the thing. Russell. Kurt Russell. <laughs> I almost said Vonnegut. <laughs> like, who the fuck am I? So it goes. <laughs> I think that just about wraps up our conversation on gods and monsters. As always, we'd like to know what you think about this movie and our conversation about it. You can find us on social media at the Film Flamers on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. You can email us at tiredqueens at filmflamers.com or call our hotline. At 972-666-7733. Call our hotline and hunt my whale. Homosexuals are standing by. <laughs> mm, I'll be a Todd Babcock. <laughs> I don't know what that means. I don't know. <laughs> Come search my dark old house. <laughs> Nice. That's my anus. <laughs> <laughs> we got it. <laughs> anyway, join us over on Patreon for when we do the whale. Well, when we deep dive the whale. <laughs> or will it be a deep dive? I think it'll be more of a derp dive of Brendan Fraser's The Whale, which he recently won an Oscar for. With all the vast connections, red yarn connections that we've made to these movies that we've already covered. Uh, And, uh, you know, join us over there. Get your episodes early and uh, your bonus episodes included. And uh, join the family. That's right. Do that at patreon.com slash the film flamers. We're going to read your name on shooting the flames if you join. So there's some extra bonus for you. And we like reviews, so head over to Apple Podcasts or iTunes and let us know why you like us. Leave us a five-star review. We're going to read that on Shooting the Flames, and we are inching ever closer to 100 reviews. So come on, help us make that happen. This wraps up all of our content on the main feed, but we have more coming out for you next month. We're going to continue our tradition of summer horror blockbusters. We're talking about The Ring. That's right. And And The the Ring ring too. too. And Ringu, maybe. That's right. Maybe. Maybe. Who knows? Maybe we'll do a James Well poll in July. <laughs> Just to make up for it. Well, Chris, I think it's time for us to uh, head off and, I don't know, do you want to sketch me? Have our World War One backflash? That's right. You want to get in my trench? <laughs> no, but I think the listeners do when they call a hotline. That's right. <laughs> my dark old house. I'm already in the trench. That's right. <laughs> it's getting hot in here. Let's go off and have some sweet sweet dreams. dreams. It is hot in here. Just as hot as Brendan Fraser mowing along with that horrible, horrible lawnmower. The bag looked like I was like in the front. Like it looked like I was spitting grass out the front of it. I was like, I don't even understand the concept well, of this that design. Fucking edger was basically it was like a spade on a stick. <laughs> <laughs> what are you gonna do with that? <laughs> 
<laughs> Nothing. Break your goddamn back is what's... Okay, anyway. <laughs> Modern conveniences. 